uh, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. You see, when we love, we know that we are born of God, and we know that we know God, is John's answer. But how does that work? How how does loving one another and our Christian brothers and sisters enable me to see that God loves me? How does loving others help me to see that God loves me? Uh, That's what we're going to explore for the next little while uh, in this passage. Uh, Well, firstly, uh, you'll see there that John begins by speaking about God's love, about God's love. In one of the most well-known parts of the Bible, John says in verse 8, we looked at this in the kids' talk, God is love. Now, uh, what do you think about that statement? God is love. Uh, It's a very popular idea, isn't it? Uh, I reckon lots of people uh, who even have a vague kind of belief that God exists are actually banking on this particular idea. That somewhere out there is a God who exists, who loves me. And when I die, it'll all be okay because this God is a God of love. He is love. But friends, uh, I want you to see very clearly that in 1 John, God is love is only half the story. For in 1 John, there is one other place that gives us a a God is statement. Now, um, I know we're all kind of tired at the moment and we probably had a late Saturday night and that sort of thing, but uh, I wonder whether you can remember the other God is statement in in 1 John. Uh, This will test whether you've been listening for the last uh, two months, but uh, uh, just uh, glance through 1 John and uh, see whether you can can spot it. Uh, where, Where does John give us another God is statement? Any takers? Yes, thank you. Where do we see that? Chapter 1, verse 5. Thank you. It says that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Uh, What does it mean that God is light? Uh, Well, it means that nothing is hidden from God. He is the light that reveals everything even the dark secrets of our hearts. He is the light that reveals all sinfulness, just like a torch will reveal all the grime on the wall. It also means that he is pure. God is so blisteringly pure that he cannot have anything to do with sin and darkness. In fact, the Bible continues to tell us that this God is a God who will judge sin and darkness and punish it. You see, God is not only love, God is light as well. And unless we understand that, well, the love of God will make no sense to us. And so, uh, have a look at verse 9. Verse 9, in this, the love of God was manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Uh, Again, I think that most people who are even vaguely religious will have no problems with something like this. I mean, uh, who doesn't like the idea of a loving God sending his precious son as a gift to give life to everyone? But it's the next verse that causes problems for many, isn't it? Verse 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us 
and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Again, it's talking about God sending his son on some kind of rescue mission. But it's the word propitiation that causes offence to so many people. Some Bible translators and theologians and pastors have sometimes tried to remove this word from the Bible because it implies that God is angry. God is angry personally at your sin and my sin. And that's not a pleasant thing. But the word is there in the Bible. For God is light as well as love. And he's personally angry when people ignore him and reject him and make a mess of this world. Uh, Now, propitiation uh, is not a word that we use in our sort of everyday speech, isn't it? I mean, mean, hands up those who have used this word uh, in conversation this week. Uh, I didn't think so. But it is something that we are all familiar with. Uh, The concept of propitiation is actually something we are all familiar with. You know, uh, my wife and I uh, celebrated our 14th uh, wedding anniversary uh, last week. I've got to tell you, in that time, I've learnt that my wife has different levels of anger. Uh, Sometimes uh, she gets mildly angry when I do something wrong, and uh, I know that, you know, I just have to keep my mouth shut and it'll pass. But I can tell when she is really angry. And uh, do you know what I do then? Well, I grab my wallet, and uh, I go to the nearest florist, and uh, I I, I buy the biggest bunch of her favourite flowers... And I come back home and I offer it to her to propitiate (laughs) her anger. I can see all the married men nodding in agreement. Uh, You know, propitiation is the idea of offering a sacrifice in order to turn away or appease someone's anger. You see, God is light means that he is personally angry at sin. At my sin and my ignorance and my rejection of my creator and arrogantly thinking that I can live my life without him makes him angry, says the Bible. I deserve nothing but God's judgment of me and yet because... God is love, well, he gives up what is most precious to him. He gives up his only, unique, precious son. And he sends him into the world. And this Jesus takes all my sin upon himself. And he is slaughtered on the cross as a sacrifice for me so that God's anger might be turned away, so that I might be forgiven and live eternally. How horrible must our sin be, friends, that this was the only way for God to forgive us? How wonderful is his love that he would send what is most precious to him, his only son into a world that rejected him and finally crucified him so that we might be forgiven and live. Friends, do you feel the weight of what John is saying here? Do you feel the weight of God's love for you? Or whenever we hear about the cross, does it just kind of fall off us like water off a duck's back? Do you see that God loves you so much that he sent his son for you? 
Do you see how great his love is that all you can do is turn around and love God for what he has done? But friends, uh, the big surprise in this passage, I think, is that the emphasis is not on loving God here. It's actually on loving others. You see, the one who understands God's love, John says, is the one who will love one another, love others in God's family. For you see, that's how you know that God loves you and is with you. Uh, You can see it there in chapter 4, verse 12. Have a look with me at chapter 4, verse 12. It says, No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Uh, Do you see what what John is saying there? Uh, I think uh, he's actually saying something very profound here. He's saying, The way you and I see the invisible God is by loving others in God's family, by loving one another. As we love one another in a way that is modelled on God's self-giving, self-offering, self-sacrificial love, well, the invisible God becomes more and more visible. Uh, You'll notice there that John uh, uses the language of perfection. Uh, It's there in verse 12. Uh, if you have a look, and it's there again in verse 17. Uh, now, some people can get quite nervous when they see this word because they think that uh, their love has to be perfect. But John isn't talking about our love here. Uh, he's actually talking about God's love being perfected in us. Uh, the word literally means to complete or to reach its desired goal. God's love comes to us in the gospel and it becomes complete, it reaches its desired goal when I start to love others in his family, when I start to love like he loves. Uh, Let me try to illustrate this. Um, We recently had electricity problems uh, in our house. Uh, One day, uh, all the lights on the bottom floor of our house uh, went out. And uh, I couldn't work out whether it was a problem with the the wiring uh, in the roof uh, or with the mains uh, which supplies the electricity to our house. Uh, So I did what I always do when something goes wrong. Um, I called Francis, our our church warden, and uh, he sent some friends uh, over uh, to come and fix the problem. There's nothing they can't fix, by the way. And uh, after a bit of work, they got the lights to work again. But you see, when I see the light bulb working, I don't have to wonder whether there's any electricity, do I? When I see the light go on, I know that the source of that light is there. The circuit is complete. The electricity, or the source, has reached its desired goal. And I think uh, in a very small way, that's sort of like what John is saying here. When you and I love others self-sacrificially, self-givingly, self-offeringly, even though I do not see God with my eyes, I know that he abides in me and I in him. And so I want to ask us this morning, Does your love and my love for others in this church show that God really is abiding in us? Is our love for others, does that show that God is really abiding in us and we in him? Um, I I find it interesting that uh, although John has spoken numerous times about love in this letter... Uh, He says it again here, after last week's passage, which was all about spiritual discernment, wasn't it? Uh, How many times have we seen people who are quick to point out theological error, but who are patently unloving in the way they treat people? 
spiritual discernment is good, but perhaps for some of us, we need to learn to love those whom we disagree with. Uh, For others, uh, we might be in conflict with uh, somebody in this church. And God's word to you this morning is to love that person. Uh, I think this is such a hard thing to do, don't you think? Uh, I reckon what Christians usually do when someone has hurt them is, uh, you know, we know that we should forgive them, but we kind of wait until that person makes the first move before we are willing to forgive. Is that true? But remember that God didn't wait for sinners to come to him. God is the one who made the first move to forgive. God is the one who sent his son into a world that had rejected him. And so perhaps if you are angry with somebody at church, perhaps you need to be the one to make the first move. Nothing that anyone has ever done to you, no matter how horrible it might be, compares with what we have done to God. And yet he loved us. And so go and do the same. Uh, Or for others, uh, we might be very good at loving a certain select group of people at church. You know, we find it easy to love our friends and, you know, there are always people who are quite popular at church that everyone loves and, well, we love them because they are lovely to us. But perhaps for you, loving others as God has loved you means venturing outside your group. But it takes too much time. It takes too much energy. I don't really want to bear that sort of cost, we might say. Well, the love that God has shown to us cost him his precious only son. Loving others will always, always be costly if it is a love that is modelled on his love. I mean, think about it, friends. Uh, The world models for us a certain kind of love, doesn't it? But when we see in our church obnoxious Barry, uh, I hope there's no one called Barry in this room at the moment, when we see in our church obnoxious Barry who was only ever interested in showing off how much he knew about the Bible, when we see him starting to love others and serve others, why, he he even brought a packet of Tim Tams to growth group last week because he wanted to share it with others. Or when we see Beth and Amy, who everyone knows have been upset with each other for many years, When we see them taking steps so that steps to be reconciled so that they are now sharing a cup of tea together over morning tea and encouraging one another. And when we see Brad and Jenny, isn't that Brad and Jenny who only ever came to church when it kind of suited them? But I can't believe it. Uh, Here they are going around asking people over to their place for a meal because they want to actually embrace people and get to know them and share their life with them. You see, when we see these sorts of things, there is something otherworldly about it, don't you think? There's a touch of God about that kind of love. The invisible God becomes visible. And we know that when that happens, as I'm sure it happens often at church at nine, well, we know that God abides in us and we in him. The circuit is complete. God's love, which has flowed into our hearts by the gospel, 
is now flowing out to give light to others. Now, uh, as we come to the end of our passage this morning, uh, you'll notice that one of the implications of loving one another in God's family is that it will lead to confidence for the day of judgment. One of the implications of loving one another in God's family is that it will lead to confidence for the day of judgment. You can see it there in verse 17. Verse 17, By this is love perfected with us, so that we may be confident for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Uh, So you see what John is saying here. Uh, He's saying that when we love one another, well, it leads to us having confidence that we will be okay on the day of judgment when Jesus returns. Uh, We don't have to fear that day, for when we love, we know that God abides in us and we in him. However, friends, I just want to say that it is possible, isn't it, to be overconfident about the day of judgment. Uh, It was C.S. Lewis who once said that Perfect love is not the only thing that drives out fear. Alcohol will do it. Ignorance will do it. Passion will do it. Stupidity will do it. I mean, think about the news reports we have every year about this time of year about schoolies who've had too much to drink hanging out of high-rise buildings putting their lives at risk. It's not only the love of God that can drive out fear. And I can easily imagine people getting overconfident as they read these verses. I mean, uh, 1, 1 John 4 is a classic passage that is read out at many, many weddings, isn't it? Uh, it's a classic wedding passage because it speaks so much about love. And uh, you can imagine chapter 4, verse 7 being read out. You know, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Uh, What might our unbelieving friends think as they read that verse, do you think? Well, I wonder whether they will look around and think to themselves, well, we're a pretty loving bunch of people here. And uh, by human standards, he'd be right. And so because we are a loving bunch of people, so we must be born of God. And if we are born of God, then we can be confident for the day of judgment. But notice, friends, that this isn't what John says in this passage. For it is not only the one who loves who can be confident... But in chapter 4, verse 13, it is the one with the Spirit of God. And it is not only the one who loves that can be confident, but in verse 15, it is the one who confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, who are the ones whom God abides in. So friends, it is only the person who confesses Jesus as their Lord and their Saviour who ultimately can be confident on the day of judgment. However, my guess is that for many of us, uh, our problem is not overconfidence, but it's actually underconfidence. Is that right? I mean, I confess that Jesus is the Son of God, but I am also painfully aware of my failure to love other people in the way that I know that I should. I wonder whether that's true of you. Uh, Many Christians are so aware of their failures that they can live in fear, not knowing what God will say to them on the day of judgment or whether they will be accepted by him. And so if that is you, 
Uh, I just want to remind you firstly about the context of 1 John. John is not writing this letter, remember, to rob Christians of our assurance. In fact, he is writing this to reassure that those who are in the church, who are confessing Jesus as Lord, are the ones who can be confident. It is actually the loveless ones who have left who cannot be confident, says John. But John would also say to you that what you and I need to do is to turn our eyes to the perfect love of God. He loved you so much that he sent his only precious son into this world. Your sin and failure, my sin and failure, was laid on him and he died in our place as our sacrifice, turning God's anger away from us, exhausting the punishment that was meant for us so that there is no punishment left for those who take refuge in Jesus. You see, the cross is where we see the love of God for us most clearly and most objectively. Let God's love cast away your fears. And then get on with loving one another. And as you do this, you will see more and more clearly that God abides in you and you in him. Let's pray.